Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 22. Having described our spiritual possessions in Christ, Paul now goes on to describe our new spiritual position in Christ. Paul in this chapter describes the miracle of salvation. God raised us up from the graveyard of sin by the same power that he raised Christ from the dead. He brought us to a place where we now sit in heavenly places with Christ. Also Paul now in this chapter wants to show both Jew and Gentile alike have received new life in Christ. As Vice President George Bush represented the United States at the funeral of the former Soviet leader Leonard Brezhnev, Bush was deeply moved by the silent protest carried out by Brezhnev's widow. She stood motionless by the coffin until seconds before the lid was closed. Just as the soldiers touched the lid, Brezhnev's wife performed an act of great courage and hope and gesture that must surely rank as one of the most profound acts of civil disobedience ever committed. She reached out and made the sign of the cross over her husband's chest. There in the citadel of secular atheist power, the wife of his most previous powerful man hoped that her husband was wrong. She hoped that there was another life, a life best represented by Jesus Christ who died on the cross and that that same Jesus might yet have mercy on her husband. We all desperately need hope. Uh, Alex Dupek, the leader of the Cheka uprising against Russia in 1968 said, Hope dies last. The person who loses hope also loses his future. In her darkest hour, Brezhnev's widow demonstrated a hope in life beyond this grave, a hope that was rooted in the trustworthiness of Jesus Christ. Now there's a difference between hope and expectation. Expectation implies a high degree of certainty about an intimate positive outcome. Should that expectation of success fail to materialize, people fall into the clutches of despair. Hope conveys the confidence and assurance that there is a better future. Hope confidently expects something good to come in the future, something to, that is desirable. Hope must refer to something in the realm of the possibility. Brezhnev's wife's hope was grounded in the realm of the possible, but it could not be translated into reality of freedom from the enslavement of sin and Satan that she sought from her husband through God's gift of grace found in Jesus Christ because in his lifetime he denied such a gift. And yet Paul assures us in this chapter that our hope is really is, is a reality for us. It's not a dream or a fantasy, but something guaranteed by the grace of God and the promises centered in Christ that all those that accept the gift of God through faith shall be saved. And section one, the dire predicament of human life without Christ. Chapter two, verses one to three. Beginning at verse one, Paul begins with these words, and you. The word you is the object of the sentence and many scholars believe that in light of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 to 12, Paul is speaking directly to the Gentiles. Here, here, in this verse, he's contemplating the miracle of salvation upon our lives. It as if he is saying this, it was on you who were so unworthy, so alienated from God, so dead to spiritual things that God took pity and raised us to new life in Christ. Now Paul continues to describe our former state before the power of God changed our lives. And he says that we were dead in trespasses and sins. And the word dead in this passage does not mean physical uh, death, but separation from God, not only physical, but spiritual. As the dead are so far separated from the living that they can no longer respond to the living, nor have a desire to communicate to the living, or any appetite for food or drink as do the living, that's how we were spiritually before the resurrection power of Christ touched us. We could not respond to God's voice. We had no desire to, com to communicate to him and no appetite for his word. As if to add insult to injury, Paul expresses his concern of our failure to live as we could and ought. He describes us as habitually locked in the trespasses of sin. And the word trespass here literally means to slip or to fall over. 
It refers to someone that, in spite of the warning signs, uh, knowing, uh, knowingly deviates from the right path in life, constantly stumbling over the same problems. Just like a person that's trapped in alcohol or in drug abuse. In spite of their good intentions and the warning signs of danger, they slip from the road of good intentions. Cross that known boundary, that known mental barrier, back to the older destructive habits of abuse. There's an old saying that says the road to hell is paved by good intentions. Now the word sin that's used here in the Greek is hamatia and it means missing the mark. It was actually used in the Greek classics of a spearman in an athletic contest throwing a spear at a target and missing it. The Greeks also used the word to describe the failure of an individual to maintain ethical standards in spite of their best efforts. And Paul uses it in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 and describes our failure to live up to the will of God despite our finest efforts. Paul tells us that we were created to glorify God. That is, this was the target for which we were to aim, to glorify God. Yet our attempts to achieve this were like the athletic spear, it falling short of the target at which it was thrown. Picking up in verses 2 and 3, our deliverance from sin is further expressed by the word walked. And as used here, it means a conscious step after step to come under the authority of another, which leads us into an immoral life and conduct contrary to God's authority. Now, this contrary authority is expressed in four ways. First, according to the course of this world. And this refers to a life that is limited by earthbound motives and worldly standards and values. Just like a flagpole is bound in the ground in which it is planted. Secondly, Paul says, according to the prince of the powers of the earth, of the air. This description fits Satan, who is the ruler of demonic forces. It is to this one that all of humanity has allowed itself to come under the authority. And the word air is different from the location of heavenly places where Christ and the believers are seated. It is the realm of Satan's kingdom. It is an atmosphere which is laden with satanic influences and forces. The word air is actually better translated as foggy atmosphere, indicating darkness, probably created by some sort of pollution that Satan prefers. The image that comes to mind here is something out of a Charles Dickens novel of a cold winter evening in London with the descending fog, with the population of, uh, uh, which is polluted by the smoke of a thousand chimneys and the occupants are coughing and spluttering with asthmatic tendencies. This is the description from these words used here. An atmosphere filled with evil and destruction upon humanity. The third authority is a spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Now this third phrase is most interesting because it shows the extent that humanity has submitted to Satan. The word works in the Greek is actually the word we get our word energizing from. Our old life without the energizing power of God was subject to the energizing power of evil, which controlled by the spirit which has evil at its source, Satan. We had no freedom, no, but rather we were under the fearful bondage of demonic forces over which we had no control. And Paul continues in verse 3 to point out the fourth authority under which we've allowed ourselves to be controlled. He says, we were all once con uh, conducted ourselves in the lust, the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Now the word flesh here does not mean living uh, tissues that cover a bony skeleton but our fallen, self-centered human nature. Paul tells us before we came to Christ that we allowed ourselves to come under the authority of abject selflessness. All that mattered to us was our own self-centered world of indulgence, ambition, and pleasure. We thought and did as we pleased. Everyone else's needs were second to our own. The result of submitting to this authority is that we become the children of wrath meaning that we have inherited the characteristics of Satan and placed ourselves under the dreadful judgment of God. Now section 2, the difference which the coming of Christ achieved in a life, chapter 2 verses 4 to 10 and verses 4 to 6. The darkness of hopelessness and despair and the need of humanity described in the above verses 
serve as a backdrop to emphasize the brightness of the outgoing love and mercy of God to those who no way deserve it. Paul therefore describes God as being rich in mercy. And that is by, by nature, he is love. One of God's intrinsic attributes is love. And when related to a sinner, it's translated as grace and mercy. Let's look first at the evidence of this grace. Paul twice in the phrases, or used the following phrase, by grace we are saved, in verses 5 to 8. Now some commentators describe verses 4 to 10 as a hymn, celebrating the glorious salvation of what is called the sola gratias, a Latin word meaning grace alone. Now grace alone is important because it is one of the distinguishing characteristics or key points that separate the true biblical gospel from false gospels that cannot save. It's one of the five solas that came to define the issue of the Protestant Reformation. This doctrine is as important today as it was then. Now the Latin word solo means alone or only and is essential Christian doctrines represented in five Latin phrases that actually summarize the biblical teachings on critical subjects. And they are sola scripta, that is, scripture alone. Sola fide, which is faith alone. Sola gratia, which is grace alone. And solus Christus, meaning Christ alone. And sola di gloria, for the glory of God alone. Each one is vitally important and they are closely tied together. Deviate from one and you will lead to error. And essentially doctrine and results will almost always be a false gospel which is powerless to save us. The truth of grace alone is what inspired John Newton to write the wonderful hymn Amazing Grace. It was grace so amazing that it can save a wretch like me. It is an amazing grace in that God demonstrated his love to us while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us, Paul says in Romans 5.8. Grace alone is important because it's the basis of our assurance of salvation as sinners before a holy God. If we deny the doctrine of grace alone, then we cannot have any true, sure assurance of our salvation. However, as mentioned before, Bursner's wife's hope that her husband would have life after death was unfounded because in his lifetime he had denied such a gift. The evidence of this rich mercy of God is seen in the fact that he does not leave us to perish in our own deserved plight or servitude of sin and death, but makes us alive in Christ. Paul, by the personal pronouns we and us, not only groups himself with the believers of that time, but stretches out forward in time to embrace all saints to come. He shows us that the mercy of God is seen in that we believers are bound in Christ in such a way that we experience Christ's resurrection and his exaltation. In verse 6, speaking of the resurrection of life, uh, Paul says this, and raised us up together. And speaking of sharing in Christ's exaltation, he says, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. The union on these experiences is stressed by the words together. Paul not only sets before us our legal standing in Christ and the hope of our glorious resurrection, but also our present condition in Christ and that, with that, that has descended upon us, enabling us to be more than conquerors through Christ in this world. Now what excites the imagination in this text is that Paul is not speaking about Christ, but he's speaking about us. Paul's vision and function of the purpose of the church is beyond this present order which we see. Paul sees that the function and purpose of the church is in heavenly places. Something else that must be noted, the phrase in Christ in Ephesians 2.6 is better translated with Christ, which shows that we have been exalted with Christ and are sharing his throne in heavenly places. This means that our position is not passive, but rather active. What happens to Christ happens to us. So the day of Christ's power, as recorded in Psalm 110 verse 3, has been extended to us. His power has become our power. And in Psalm 110 verse 3, we find that when God's people saw the power of God, they willingly took on the position of this power. Now coming to verse 7, 
Paul states that God has raised us up into heavenly places, that in the ages to come, that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. And the word show here is actually better translated as display. Here in this verse, we discover the purpose of the transforming power of Christ that is to be displayed for all eternity to come. His grace, his mercy, his matchless beauty. Once a Roman matron was asked, where are your jewels? And calling her two sons to her side, pointed to them, she sent these words, these are my jewels. Paul looked forward to a time when our Lord Jesus Christ, when God the Father would say, where are your jewels? And he will call us to his side and embrace us with loving arms and say, Father, these are my jewels. Next we find the phrase, his kindness towards us, which involves the idea of exercising kindness towards us to make us useful. Here we see that we, the church, are not a covert operation slinking amongst the shadows of the corridors of eternity. We are on display in heavenly places for all to see. Our usefulness in Christ, which is far beyond the expectation of the principalities and powers. Our usefulness is seen in Ephesians 6, 12, where we do wrestle against principalities and powers in the strength of Christ with Christ in heavenly places. I mean, one can imagine God calling the church to his side and saying to the principalities and powers in heaven, this is my army, the jewel in my crown, coming in my power, filled and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So shake and tremble before them. Coming again to now to verses 8 and 9. Again, we find the repeated and expanded upon the phrase, by the grace you have been saved. These verses are often described as the gospel in a nutshell. For here we see the two sides of salvation, God's side grace and our side faith. Our part is faith only because we only have to accept what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Why? It is because God's salvation for humanity through Christ is complete. There is no defects, faults or inadequacy found in it for it is perfect. Because of this, there is no reason for anyone anyone need to contribute to it by their own merits or by their own efforts. It is a gift of God. During the Spanish and American uh, War, Claire Barton was overseeing a work in the Red Cross Cuba. And one day, Colonel Theodore Roosevelt came to her, wanting to buy food for his sick and wounded Rough Rider troops. But she refused to sell it to him. Roosevelt was perplexed. His men needed their help and he was prepared to pay for it out of his own funds. When he asked someone why he couldn't buy the supplies, he was told, Colonel, just ask for it. And it said a smile broke over his face. He understood that the provisions were not for sale. All he had to do was to simply ask and they would be freely given. Paul emphasizes that the total initiative of our salvation is available, uh, is solely available due to God. If God should abandon his efforts or to refuse to put his salvation into operation, then we would be lost forever. God clearly rejects our efforts at gaining salvation by works, as highlighted in verses 8 and 9. As stated before, the doctrine of grace alone separates the gospel of Christianity from all other religions and cults. Because of this, Grace alone, we possess eternal life and are seated in heavenly places. There's a story told of a pastor who, went, who once went to a barber to get a haircut. All through the haircut, the, master, the pastor wanted to witness to the barber, but the barber just kept uh, talking and gave the pastor no chance to interrupt. Later, when the pastor was paying for the haircut, he asked the barber if he was a good man, and the barber replied, and that he was. Then the pastor asked if the barber believed in God, and the barber affirmed that he did. The pastor then asked if the barber thought he was going to heaven, and the barber said that he would because he's been a good man. But then the pastor seemed to change the conversation and said to the barber, you also need a haircut. The barber agreed and said that he did, but he's just been so busy that he's not had a chance. The pastor replied, well, don't worry, you have a few minutes now, sit down and I'll cut your hair. The barber quickly told the pastor that he couldn't do that because he wasn't trained. The pastor assured the barber that he would truly do his best 
The barber laughed at him and said, your best is not good enough to do it right. The pastor then replied, that's right. Trying to be the best person you can simply is not good enough to get to heaven. Paul says, not by works, lest anyone should boast. God's, from God's standpoint, none of our good works or good deeds are good enough to obtain salvation. Coming now to verse 10. Paul now explains why there is no place of boasting or pride in salvation. It's because we are his workmanship or his handiwork. The Greek word workmanship here means something that is made. And it's interesting that this Greek word is the word we get our word poem from. A great poem is often considered to be a masterpiece of human emotion and thought, such as T.S. T. S. Eliot's poem, Ash Wednesday, or William Wordsworth's poem, I Wander Lonely as a Cloud. So we are the masterpiece of God's deepest thoughts and emotions, which are on display in our salvation by the grace of God. Just as a farmer painstakingly prepares the soil into which to plant a seed to prepare a harvest for a healthy crop, so Paul tells us that God has taken great care in preparing our lives and has now planted a seed of faith in our hearts in order to bring forth life to his praise and glory. The great reformer, John Calvin, said these words, Man is saved by faith alone, but faith that saves does not remain alone. It brings forth good works and good character. William Barclay said, We cannot earn God's love, but we can and must show how grateful we are for him by seeking with our whole hearts to live the kind of life which would bring joy to God's heart. Salvation is not the end in itself, but the beginning of growth, where visible signs are seen. Just as the growth of a fruit tree is judged by its fruit, so is our Christian life. Paul ends this section with some encouraging words regarding our good works for Christ. He says, God prepared in advance for us to do that we should walk in them. Linking with the fact that God has prepared us for good works shows us that God himself has prepared each step. As long as we keep our spiritual eyes upon God, we find that God will set, will order our, our steps and our life and will be for, fulfilled and a blessing to those with whom we come in contact with. Section B, Unity in Christ, chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Though the ancient world was filled with barriers, each race felt themselves to be far superior to other races. Cicero, a Roman philosopher who introduced the Romans to the Greek school of philosophy around about 200 BC, wrote, as the Greeks say, all men are divided into two classes, Greeks and barbarians. The Jews had an immense hatred for the Gentiles. They said that God had created the Gentiles to fuel the fires of hell. And if a Jew married a Gentile, then a funeral was held for that Jew. Yet in the midst of racial prejudice, Paul boldly proclaims that Christ has come into the world to bring peace and to tear down all barriers between all humanity aliens and strangers chapter 2 verses 11 to 12 this section undoubtedly is addressed to gentiles here paul lists our inadequacies before we met christ as savior first he says that we were uncircumcised meaning that we are totally outside of the covenant blessings of god found in the promises given to abraham in genesis chapter 12 15 and 17. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2, 15 to 29, that when God made the difference between Jew and Gentile through circumcision and the promises to Abraham, it was not for the Jews to boast, but so they might be a blessing and a help to the Gentiles. Sadly, some Jews turned to heathen gods, and those that didn't lost the truth of the promise by turning them into legalistic rituals thus reducing the opportunity for Gentiles to find God. And secondly, Paul says that we were separated from Christ, and this means that we lack the messianic hope. The word Christ in the Greek is Christo, and it means anointed one. When a king, kings are anointed at their, at their coronation, they are called the anointed ones. In the Hebrew, it is the Messiah. For the Jews, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, was the expected king who would come and set up a golden age of salvation and redemption. 
In spite of their failings, the Jews never lost this hope. Before Paul came to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, the Ephesian Gentiles knew nothing of the coming of Christ. They worshipped the famous goddess Diana. That religion, like most religions and philosophies today, with the exception of Judaism and Christianity, was destitute of knowledge and expectation of the Messiah. Since Christ is the only Redeemer and mediator between God and man, to be without Christ, the Anointed One, is to live a life without hope of redemption and access to the true and living God. Thirdly, he says that we were aliens and strangers to the promise. The terms alien and strangers refer to a person who bears the stigma of a foreigner living in a country not of their birth, unable to qualify for citizenship, therefore missing out on the privileges that of citizenship. In the ancient world, as today, foreigners were always viewed with suspicion and were never felt to be trusted or associated with. So the Gentiles, by the fact of birth, were deprived of entering into the privileges of the Jewish covenant of promise. The covenants recorded in the Old Testament brought Israel into a special relationship with God and afforded them some hope of forgiveness of sin and favour with God. But this was not the case for the Gentiles. Up to the coming of Christ, we Gentiles stood as people with no hope. And that is the fourth inadequacy. We were without hope. As mentioned earlier, Alex Dupent, the leader of the Czech uprising against Russia in 1968, said, hope dies last. The person who loses hope also loses the sense of future. Without hope, we have no future. Without Christ, we have no prospect of future, no assurance beyond this life. Many ancient philosophers took the circle view of history, which meant there was no goal to anything. Life just went around and around. This attitude led to despair and recklessness. It's no different today. Many people have no knowledge of the divine plan of salvation found in Christ, have little to hope for in this world, and nothing to hope for beyond this life. And fifthly, he says that we were without God in this world, which means that even though the ancient world and the world today have many gods, philosophies, and ideologies, we have no clear, they, no clear sense of one single overarching divine power in charge of the world's affairs. Now, section 2, end of barriers, chapter 2, verses 13 to 18. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. There's an interesting story told of an extraordinary event that took place more than 100 years ago during the First World War on the battlefields of France. The two great armies of France and Germany met in a horrific battle. The two armies clashed head on, pushing each other backwards and forwards over a few hundred meters of ground at a terrible loss of life. A French sergeant and some of his men had made a pact that if any of them should be killed in battle, the others would give them a Christian burial. As the battle continued, one of their number was killed. At a particular time of the battle, the German army suddenly retreated leaving the French army on the battlefield. The sergeant and four of his men decided that now they could honour their commitment to bury their comrade in a Christian cemetery. Gaining permission from their commanding officer, they took their, command, their comrade to a Catholic ceremony, uh, cemetery for burial. When they arrived at the Catholic church, they were met by a priest who told them that he was duty-bound under the tenant of the church to ask them some questions before he would permit their comrade to be buried in the graveyard. The first question he asked them, is the man a practicing Catholic? The soldiers replied that they didn't know. And did their comrade own a rosary or a medal of St. Christopher or a picture of Mary? Again, they replied and they didn't know. Was your friend a baptized Catholic? He inquired. Again, they didn't know. Then the priest regrettably told them he could not permit them to bury their friend in the graveyard as it was against the church tenants. However, he would permit them to bury their friend outside of the graveyard next to the northern fence. To this the soldiers disappointedly agreed. And the next day the soldiers were ordered up to the front and just before they did they returned to the graveyard to pay their last respects to their comrades. To their astonishment, they could not find the grave. They searched the northern, the southern, the eastern, the western fences, but they could not find any trace of the freshly dug grave. 
And as they're about to leave, bewildered and discouraged, the priest came running out and told them that his conscience and heart had troubled him all through the night because he refused to allow them to bury their comrade in the cemetery. So in the morning, before it was light, he took a pick, a shovel, hammer and nails, and with his own hands, he moved the fence. He moved the fence to include within the cemetery the body of the young soldier who had died for friends. You know, this is a perfect picture of God's work of salvation in our lives. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.8, that is by grace we are saved. It's a gift of God that we could not accomplish it by what we could do. He also tells us in Ephesians 2.14 that Christ has broken down the wall of separation from us God. The dead soldier was unable to earn the right to be included in the graveyard. Nor could his friends. It took the effort and grace of the priest to include the French soldier in the graveyard. It is the same with us. We have no right whatsoever to be included in the kingdom of God. Paul says in this passage that we were aliens and strangers to God. In this story we see the perfect plan of salvation. Man's great need by the French soldier. The atoning work of Christ. The priest moving the fence. And the grace of God the Father accepting a sinner into the kingdom of God. Now it's the same for us Gentiles. We were without Christ but now we are in Christ. Just as a soldier came into the graveyard through the efforts of the priest, so we have come into the kingdom of God through Christ's efforts. There was once a great gulf separating us from God and His promises, yet a wonderful way has been made for us to secure those promises. Though once far from God, through Christ's death, the shedding of His blood and sacrifice, we have been brought near to God. In the story, the Catholic priest moved the graveyard fence because his conscience would not let him sleep. This is not the case with God. It was his great love for us that motivated him to send his son to come as our great high priest through his death and resurrection to move the wall to include us. Those nail-scarred hands of Christ have not brought us into a graveyard. But instead we've been brought into the glorious kingdom of God and made to be sons of God. Paul points out that the peace that Christ has brought into our lives is not only between us and God, but also between man and man. Paul tells us that it's Christ who's broken down the middle wall of separation in verse 14. This refers to the division of race, colour, creed and class that exists between all humanity. Paul, as he penned these words, would have remembered the temple in Jerusalem and the words they would have seen many times engraved upon a one and a half metre wall that separated the court of the Gentiles from the court of Israel. Trespassers will be executed. Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that the temple was enclosed with a one and a half metre wall with the inscription forbidding foreigners to cross over on the pain of death. You know, the Greeks were no different in their restriction of others from worshipping their God. Two excavations in 1871 and 1935 of Greek temples found these words written on it. No foreigner may enter within the barrier of the enclosed around the temple. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for their ensuing death. You know, the ancient world is not unlike our world today. It is full of barriers. Father Taylor of Boston said these words, there is just enough room in this world for all the people in it, but there is no room for fences which separate them. Sir Philip Gibbs said these words, Modern progress has made the world a neighbourhood. God has given us the task of making it a brotherhood. Now coming down to verses 15 and 16. Paul tells us, For the barriers of racial prejudice and animosity and hostility to be broken down between Jew and Gentile and Gentile and Gentile, Christ himself had to come and personally deal with the problem. The issues of tension that exist between Jew and Gentile was the law, with its detailed ordinance of religious ceremonies and regulations about who and what was clean and unclean. These regulations imposed an impassable barrier of hatred and anger between two groups. In September 1938, Germany loomed as a great superpower ready to vow the world in 
racial bitterness. The then Prime Minister of England, Sir Neville Chamberlain, went to Germany to speak to Adolf Hitler, hoping to bring peace to the situation. He hoped through his personal visit that he might alleviate the animosity and anger Germany felt towards the Allies for the oppressive demands of the treaties of Versailles placed upon the German people at the end of the First World War. He, re he returned triumphantly and stated on the 30th of September 1938 in a speech titled Peace in Our Times concerning the Munich Agreement and the Anglo-German Declaration that he had secured peace with Germany. But he had it. That feeling of hatred towards the Allies was still there and exactly one year later Hitler invaded Poland unleashing the Second World War which went down in history of one of the world's worst racial wars ever recorded. Chamberlain could not save the day because he could not remove the hatred that existed between the two sides. However Christ could save the day through the work on the cross, he brought peace in our time between Jew and Gentile because he could remove the areas of animosity that existed between us by fulfilling the law with its detailed orders of religious ceremonies and regulations about who was clean and not clean. Verses 17 and 18. One can almost hear Paul's voice rising with excitement as he pens these words. And he says, And he, Christ, came and preached to you who were afar off. That is, to us Gentiles who were without Christ, without hope, without the covenant promise of God, Christ came. Not only to the Gentiles did Christ come, but he came to those who had hope, covenant and promises to the Jews. Christ brought peace in our time, not only between Jew and Gentile, but peace between us and God. Praise God, what a wonderful Saviour is our Lord Jesus. Paul continues, Through Him, that's Christ, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. The Greek word for access is better translated as the word introduction. The word was used in Oriental courts of someone being ushered into the presence of royalty and introduced to a king. There's a story told of a little boy that stood outside the gates of Buckingham Palace in London. He wanted to talk to the king, but he was sternly rebuked by the guard at the gate. He rubbed his grubby hand on his cheek to wipe away the tears, and just then a well-dressed man appeared and asked the little fellow to explain his trouble. When he heard the story, the man smiled and said, Here, hold my hand, sonny. I'll get you through. Just never mind about those soldiers. The little boy took the hand and to his surprise he saw the soldiers suddenly leap to attention and present arms at his new friend as the new friend approached. Past the guard he was led along the carpet walls, through uh, wide flung doors, on and through to a room where the King of England was seated. He'd taken the hand of the Prince of Wales, the King's son, through him he had gained access. This is the picture that Paul has in mind, that Christ had opened the door for us so that we might be brought right into the presence of God. Not coming in condemnation or judgment, but with joy. And as I look at these verses, I can imagine Paul overcome by joy, leaping to his feet, praising God for such a privilege. Christ is the only door, the only way to the Father. Through him, we are reconciled both to God and to each other. The Spirit mentioned here is undoubtedly the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. It is His work in both Jew and Gentile's hearts in the ministry of reconciliation that is drawing us and introducing us to the Saviour of the world, assuring us that we are sons of God, the Father, as recorded in Romans and in Galatians. The third section, one household, one building, chapter 2. Verses 19 to 22. Looking at verse 19. The picture that is being presented in this verse is that no longer do Gentiles hold second class status in the family of God. We are fellow citizens, free from the stigma of an alien. We are no longer amongst God's people on sufferance. Though through Christ's atonement, we are members of the family of God and at home with him. There's a story told of the building of the royal palace of Tehran in Iran. When you come into the palace, the ceiling and walls flash like diamonds with multiple reflections. Originally, this is not how the palace was designed. 
The architect had designed so the walls and the ceilings would be covered with huge mirrors. When the shipment arrived from Paris, the contractor, the contractor found, to his horror, that the mirrors had been shattered. So he threw them into the trash and brought the sad news to the architect. Amazingly, the architect ordered that all the broken pieces be collected, then smashed into tiny pieces, then glued to the wall and ceiling in a mosaic, silvering, shimmering, mirrored bits of glass. The broken now had become an object of beauty. This is what the grace of God has done in our lives. We were alienated from God, like broken pieces of mirror, only fit to be thrown in the trash bin. Yet God, like that architect, took the broken pieces of our lives and transformed them into a marvellous work of His grace for all to see and to wonder at with amazement for all eternity. Verse 20. Nothing is more important in a building than its foundations. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, 24 to 27, spoke of two builders, one who built upon the sand and one who built upon the rock. The one that built upon the rock is likened to those who took on board Christ's teaching. The reference to apostles and prophets here does not mean church leaders, but the teachings of the scriptures which have been delivered to us by the New Testament apostles and the Old Testament prophets. The church is built upon the word of God in the scriptures. Individual, the individual church stands and falls by its loyalty to the foundational truths found in the scriptures. Verses 21 to 22. To distress, to stress the unity we have in Christ, Paul tells us that we're all part of one building. Paul sees Christ as the cornerstone of that building and that everything else is locked into Christ. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2 verse 5 that our encounter and assimilation with Christ has also caused us to become living stones. And we have become, uh, we've been built up into a spiritual house. He also tells us that the apostles are the foundation. Yet unlike other buildings, this building is always growing, being added to over and over again. One way you can think of it is like a great English cathedral that has grown over many years to meet the demands of its increasing population. You are likely to find that the original structure was Saxon in, divine, in design. The added wings become Norman and Gothic in, de, in design. And still further extensions may take on a more modern approach. So the church is the same. It is ever growing in unity. It's not made up of just first century Christians, but all saints of all generations. Paul tells us that we are fitted together. Meaning that each one of us finds our place and function in relationship to Christ as all parts of the building find its right relationship within Christ. Paul tells us that wherever this spiritual building is, there is a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. His love, His forgiveness and renewing power is present in the Spirit. Clinker bricks are bricks that have not quite made it. For some reason or another, they've come out of the kiln, misformed or deformed. There's a Presbyterian church in New York State that was intentionally built of clinker bricks. Apparently the congregation wanted to send a message, so they built the church of imperfect, rejected bricks. The message is that we are all clinker bricks. We are all sinners. We are all imperfect people, full of weaknesses and imperfections. But through Christ, we become a living stones in his church. We do not become living stones because we are great. It is Christ who is great. He has connected us to his church through him. Finally, we read the conclusion. One cannot overemphasize the importance of grace alone as recorded in this chapter of Ephesians as the necessity for our salvation and the unity of the church. The hymn Amazing Grace is one of the most recognisable hymns in the English-speaking world. As you're aware, it's written by John Newton, a cruel slave trader who found the grace of God and became a minister of the gospel. Newton wrote the words from the same personal experience of which Paul wrote this chapter. He was a man like us, without God, without Christ, without hope, outside of the promises of God contained in the covenant. 
one night in a terrible storm, battered his vessel so severely that he became frightened enough to call out to God's mercy, a moment that marked the beginning of his spiritual conversion. The hymn contains a message that through the grace of God alone, forgiveness and redemption are possible regardless of the sins that a person has committed. The author, Gilbert Chase, writes that the hymn Amazing Grace is without a doubt the most famous hymn of all folk hymns. It is estimated that it's performed about 10 million times a year. This hymn, more than anything else, clearly shows that the wall of animosity and hatred has been broken down between Jew and Gentile, and Gentile and Gentile. Christians from all around the world, both Jew and Gentile, can lift their voice and show that we are united together under the mercy and the grace of God. Grace alone saves us. Thank you.